I'm going to invite Katie and Karen to come forward to light our Christ light and our light of affirmation. Thank you so much. We welcome you all here today to celebrate and honor a very, very special life of Dr. James William Gordon Nicholson. Friends, hear these words of scripture that they may bring you peace. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted and the eternal God of your dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms, the arms of love and the arms of care. In this place are hearts of family and friends filling this sacred space with the love of the divine within each of us. We are grateful for your presence here and for the wonderful life of James, or Jim, as many of us know, Nicholson, and we also today want to honor his older brother who is with us through our virtual live streaming, and we're very grateful that he can tune in today. We also want to celebrate and honor all the good folks who were not able to be here but will be able to see it online. The land on which we are seated, literally, we'd like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous people of all the lands that we are here today. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of these lands that we call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and our responsibility in improving relations between nations and to improving our own understanding of our local indigenous peoples and their cultures. Let us join together in song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. You will find that in the Red Hymn Books, number 670.
Please be seated. As we center in prayer, we also invite you to turn to page 914 in the hymn book. Let us pray. God, creator and giver of life, source of love and joy, we come into your presence to celebrate a life, a very special life of James William Gordon Nicholson. God, you are a source of mystery and compassion, attentive to the needs of all our hearts, and we're grateful for Jim's rich, long life. And while we grieve this loss, we see the light and the peace of your ways revealed in Jesus the Christ, in whose name we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, in 2014, we had a, a wonderful service for Betty. And so we tried to take that time together and to place it inside this service. And so we share together now the 23rd Psalm that is printed in your bulletin. Yahweh is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for the sake of his name. Even though I walk through the darkest of valleys, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You are always with me. Your rod and your staff, they give me peace. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and your love will follow and pursue me. Your love will chase me down all of my days and I will dwell in the house of your divine love forever. I'm going to invite Emily to come and share a reading from the Gospel of John. Good morning. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may also be. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Thank you. And I'm going to invite Barb Nicholson to come up and share a poem. Granddad was a lover of family and a lover of tradition. And one tradition that we 
held true to for almost the 40 years that Dan and I were married, was a Christmas Eve dinner. And at every Christmas Eve, we would read, it was the night before Christmas. And over the years, I took great liberties with this poem and adopted it to recognize some special things that happened over the year in our family. One year, many, many years ago, before even all of his grandchildren were born, I wrote this particular adaption, and Jim had asked for a copy of it. Over the last week when we were going through his pictures in a keepsake box, this poem was tucked in there. And so I'm going to attempt to read it. I have a bit of a voice issue, but <clears throat> for some reason he felt it was important to keep. "'Twas the night before summer, when in the Nicholson house, the children were excited and jumping about. The book bags were put up high and away until the 4th of September, a new school day. The children were packing for a very special place, putting shorts and t-shirts in their suitcase. And Barb was frantic and Dan was calm, knowing that tomorrow we would all be gone. When suddenly Jake began barking and running around, afraid he'd be forgotten if he didn't make a sound. Away to the van, he ran like a flash, jumped in the back, and sat down with a crash. The bags, coolers, and bikes all went in. How to make them fit was making Dan's head spin. When what to, wonder, to do Dan's wondering eyes should appear but many more bags and a six-pack of beer. <laughs> they drove very carefully, if rather quick, to get to Northport. Where else would they pick? They arrived oh so happy, safe, and sound, and when they opened the door, look who they found. Oh, Karen, oh, Yoren, oh, Betsy, and Rocky. Oh, Thomas, and Alex, and Sarah, and Freddie, and old Uncle Arnold, and crazy Aunt Claire, and Paula, and Andrew, with gray in his hair. The children were happy to see one another. They couldn't stop yelling, hooray, it's the summer. So down to Amy's, the children they ran, with giggles and laughs and toys from the van. The adults kept tradition and opened a brew. They walked to the bank to see what was new. As they stood on the bank and watched with delight, the third sandbar came slowly into sight. The beach, how it beckoned with waves and the surf, and the sun was shining all over the turf. Umbrellas and chairs were carried to the beach with towels and pop and sun lotion all in reach. Oh, how we love Northport. Nor Northport's the best. The kids love the swimming, the adults the rest. The walks on the beach at low tide and sunset are times of pure pleasure you'll never forget. Greg loves beach combing and hunting for crabs. Katie likes splashing and chasing the big black lab. Jennifer likes body surfing and catching the perfect wave. Barb will join her. Dan's not that brave. The sun, how it shines, the water so cool, the cottage is perfect, obviously not built by a fool. The big bonfires built down on the sand, the stars overhead <clears throat> shining down on the land. Walks to the point with Dan in the lead, carrying a picnic lunch, a right jolly old feed, and firework celebrations that light up the sky. So many good times, who wants to say goodbye? To the very best place for summertime fun, our vacation time is over, it is all done. 
So with a wave to the beach, as we drove up the lane, the Nicholson gang were heard to exclaim, see you next year, and we're so glad we came. Now it is time for some words of remembrance from Tom. Tom Nicholson. As everyone said, no pressure. Yeah, no pressure. Thanks, Aunt Burr. Thank you all for being here. Uh, see a lot of friendly, familiar faces. Gang, how are you? Uh, thank you, Reverend. And Thank you, music ministry. Um, writing an obituary or a eulogy can be a daunting task, especially for a man who lived as full of a life as our grandfather. But luckily for us, granddad was a very prepared man, so he wrote his obituary himself. <laughs> uh, he did that before it was trendy, by the way. Um, and I've taken the liberty of adding some color to that obituary, and I'm um, very thankful that our family contributed. And when I asked for color, it rolled in fast and in multitudes. And as I read through everyone's messages, what became clear to me was that this eulogy did not need to emphasize only who Granddad was, but how he was, and the profound influence that both he and Nana Betty had on all of us. So beyond preparedness, which we've already established, probably something that had to do with being born in the Great Depression, um, I would invite you to reflect today on Granddad's other characteristics, as well as his quirks, his nature, and most importantly, his values. Because while Granddad is no longer here to live out those values in front of us, I think that we have all absorbed them over time. And it's our turn to carry forward all the lessons that he and Nana imparted upon us. So, number one, hard work. He started in a two-room schoolhouse in Crapo, PEI, and wound up with a PhD from Cornell. So at some early age, he embraced the concept of hard work into his life because this was not the common trajectory for a young man from Crapo at the time. Um, he spent decades educating himself while starting a family and moving multiple times. Uh, once he began his career in animal, as an animal nutritionist, it didn't stop. He published prolifically, uh, and he pushed to find applications for the research that he wrote. Somehow, he also found time to uh, volunteer and to help raise four children, who I'm told weren't always easy. Um, and uh, even observing him in retirement, uh, I think it was ingrained in him. Into his late 80s, he'd spend hours in the garden <laughs> at the lake, much to our dismay at times, uh, under heat and mosquito attacks. And uh, while I do think it might have been ingrained in his DNA, uh, I also think that he understood that the beer on the front porch watching the sunset was going to taste all the better for it. Number two, curiosity. Hard work alone doesn't draw you from Crapo to Charlottetown to Montreal to New York to Amherst to England and beyond. I think curiosity was granddad's drive. He was enthralled by the natural world and fascinated by culture and history and like many who are curious, science was a natural fit the process to explain everything around him. Curiosity also meant that when the opportunity arises to say, become one of the first scientists to visit post Mao China and begin relations with previously unreachable colleagues from halfway around the world, he jumped at the opportunity. Uh, I won't forget the wonder in his face as he described cattle with stomach observation holes in their sides sedated only with acupuncture didn't seem to mind as he was peeking around in there. I was just trying to not throw up. Um, 
Being naturally curious also allows you to find a, a unique mutated pink rose and propagate it. Lucy Irene is still produced and distributed by nurseries today. I'm told that the scientific process did not end at work. A ubiquitous comment from his children was that they always found that they had what they needed, but a want? A want was different. A want would be subject to scientific rigor. A series of pressure-tested questions for which, if one was not sufficiently prepared, they may find that their want was frivolous. For instance, one summer, my dad wanted to go to camp with all of his friends. Uh, when prodded to articulate what value camp might provide to justify the cost, the best he could come up with was that he would get to go canoeing. Poor answer. <laughs> there was a canoe at the lake he was free to use at any time, so Arnold watched on as his friends went to camp that summer. <laughs> this rule of scientific rigor, however, seemed to dissipate a bit when the grandchildren arrived because what we remember were trips to the convenience store to get the paper, the harbor. Um, that was code for penny candy. Um, and other less scientific pursuits, such as a highly requested reading of I Wish That I Had Duck Feet by Dr. Seuss. Curiosity also drove a love for adventure. Granddad and I traveled the world. They visited dozens of countries. And someone doesn't simply travel to dozen of, dozens of countries if they don't have a desire to learn and explore, especially if one has a moderate to severe fear of flying. Uh, I didn't know about that fear of flying until recently, but it would certainly help to explain why you would even consider spending six weeks with four young children camping out of a Ford Cortina all across Europe. <laughs> there was a couple beautiful pieces of family lore tied to that, that trip, trying to give Uncle Andrew away. A magical return of Nana's lost purse in Venice. Number three, Grandad was gentle and he was patient. Now, oh, I have seen Granddad perhaps a little ticked, ticked off before. Perhaps uh, there were times where he came outside to see three children on a trampoline, which had a very strict one-child limit. But I racked my memory, and I can truly say that I don't think I'd ever heard him raise his voice. His children may recall differently. There's a certain Dan the Man story that's coming to mind, you know, ask about that in uh, the reception, I'm sure. But he was always level-headed and above the fray. He showed us that you can be gentle and still command respect. He was just the type of person you didn't want to let down. Four, he was stable. Mrs. Dash seasoning every meal, that meal being bought from the co-op, dessert after every meal, an afternoon nap to digest that meal, were just some things that you could depend on. <laughs> but seriously, um, through their presence, I think Nana and Granddad built the whole foundation for our families. They created traditions that still carried on today, like looking at old embarrassing photos over the big screen at Christmas. Uh, the outfits and haircuts from the 70s are particularly special. You'll see some of those in the reception as well. Um, I don't think that we can overestimate the impact of having a reliable, consistent, safe, and caring man head our family for so long. Five, I'd be remiss to say if I didn't mention that he was just simply brilliant. As Uncle Andrew said he was the original Google the perfect way to deflect a tricky question from a curious child was to simply proclaim it a granddad question and pick up the phone. The depth and breadth of his general knowledge was astonishing. Uh, his memory was almost exasperating right up till the end. Um, a couple months ago, we were asking about a trip to Scotland as Dan and Barb went off, and <laughs> the amount of detail he could conjure up uh, from decades ago was astonishing. Number six, love. It was demonstrated in so many ways, both subtle and forthright. He loved his community and always gave back, whether it was volunteering at the Y, the church, the 
botanical gardens. He loved our friend, his friends. They curled, played bridge, hosted famous Grey Cup parties, and he loved our Nana Betty. 1955 was a long time ago, and they embodied the mutual respect and modeled what a loving partnership could be. And he loved our family. He'd always tell us that he just wanted us to be around. And what a job they did creating the perfect environments to bring everyone together. I can't tell you how many hours he spent just sitting on the beach and watching us play in the water. So when the call came that he had passed, well, it might not have been a surprise, it might have been a bit of a relief. Nothing could diminish the weight of losing such a hardworking, curious, adventurous, gentle, stable, brilliant, and loving man. Perhaps the, the most beautiful piece of recurring commentary that um, so many of us um, had independently arrived at the exact same ethical litmus test we use when we're making tough decisions. Just simply ask, what would Nana and Grandad be proud of? And I find in just framing it that way, I already know the answer. What better legacy could anyone ask for? To be the North Star. Thank you. Tom, that was so beautiful that we sort of have to take a moment to breathe all that in because it truly is an exquisite way to describe an incredible man. We're going to sing a hymn now in the garden. The words are on the back of your bulletin.
Please be seated. Writer Elizabeth Johnson notes how the reading from John that Emily read a little while ago contains promises that are profoundly comforting to us facing death of a loved one. It may feel strange to hear these words that are so often spoken in the Lenten season that we naturally think of how the text speaks to us about life after death. But Johnson reminds us that this is also very much a story of the here and now. It speaks to us about a profound, profound, deep connection between the divine and Jesus, deeper than perhaps we can even begin to fully comprehend. The setting of faith story, of this faith story, is Jesus' farewell address and the Last Supper with the disciples. Jesus tells the disciples what is to follow and that he'll only be with them a little while longer. In this conversation, we learn from the disciples that their beloved teacher is leaving them, that one of their own members has turned against them, and that the stalwart leader among the disciples is on the cusp of a great failure of loyalty. Oof, that's an awful lot to hear. It's a bit of a shock, and they are feeling completely unhinged, like we do when a beloved one dies. The ground shifts beneath them in the exact same way. As we take time to reflect on Jim's life and a rich life, we can understand the bond that Jesus has with his disciples and Jim's bond not only with Christ, but with all who he connected with in his family and in his colleagues and with people through his faith community. And that's just to name a few. Jim was a very kind soul. I repeatedly heard that over the last week. He was so kind, so gentle, and I heard as well would never raise his voice. That's astounding, and that's absolutely wonderful. He nurtured the values that his parents brought within him to seek to be a learner and always be a learner. And for him, that meant striving for a post-secondary education. And that was a value that he instilled within his and Betty's children and their children. His determined spirit showed us how self-motivation can lead you to all of your dreams. Dan and Andrew suggested that this trait might stem from Jim's Scottish heritage to be thrifty with your coinage. But I think it had a lot more to do with a deeper value of learned skills that you can teach others. So Jim completed many projects from practical additions at the cottage on the Quapit Lake to sharing the learning of agriculture with so many others in the best way he knew how. He wrote about it. He was a prolific writer, and sharing all of that learning was so integral to his being, and we are so grateful for that. I think in turn that he was such an amazing role model for all of us, because he had a wonderful way of sharing his being and his talents and his talents were all from that core that said, I need to serve others. Now, he didn't come out and say that. He wasn't a preaching type. He would turn around and say, in me, I have gifts that I have been given, and I need to share them to the best of my ability. For him, 
The goals were humble ones. They might astound us, I know they astound me, but to offer help to others in a way that you can, in, in, in the best way that you can, is such a sacred part of who Jim was. And he and Betty built on their love things like a family pancake breakfast. Dan said to me that there was no happier time than when he was flipping pancakes for the grandkids. And I could just see that too. I love Andrew's words to describe his father as two seasons, curling and gathering. And between those seasons was a sacred time of sitting on that deck at the lake after a creative day with everyone there. The kids swimming, the dogs running around, and maybe a little brew now and then sitting beside the chair. What a beautiful image of all of creation was before him. Family, children, animals, nature, the water. Oh, just breathtaking, just breathtaking. When we experience the death of a loved one, these deep connections emerge more powerfully in our awareness. They tint our present experiences with deep separation and feelings of that. And we can become very anxious, of course. But Jesus reminds us that we know the place where Jesus went and to not let our hearts be troubled. Words, words of calm and words of celebration. Don't let your heart be troubled. Unlike Thomas, of course, who, who takes everything literally and speaks about wanting to have a map and some directions, maybe some instruction manuals, fair enough, and Jesus simply says, trust me. Not like a trump card that speaks about his way or the highway. Jesus simply offers the invitation, trust in me. Trust in me. And what does that look like? Well, certainly it was flipping pancakes for Jim, planting and tending in creation, sitting on the deck in the warm sunshine with loved ones, open doors for, as a night supervisor for drop-in evenings, sharing stories of love and kindness with children, cherish shared meals and a game of bridge in community, giving generously of your resources and your gifts to everyone you encounter without judgment and strive to make your rock sail over the hog line. Jim, you did all of these things and you have left such a deep legacy for us and we are so grateful. So now we celebrate your life as you join your beloved wife, Betty, in a new learning adventure in the one to whom who came and offered so much trust. Amen and amen.
Let us pray. O oh God of strength, our Redeemer, giver of life and conqueror of death, we praise you with humble hearts. In your presence, we remember Jim Nicholson, and we praise you for his steadfast love for him all of the days of his earthly life. We thank you for all that he was to those who loved him and for his faithfulness to communities of love and sharing. All sickness and sorrow are ended in death. Jim entered his eternal home where all of your people gather in peace. We pray for Jim's extended family, remembering his children, Dan and Barb, and their children, Greg and Allie, Daniel, their son-in-law, and daughter, Katie. We offer prayers for Betsy and husband, Bjorn, and their children, Karen and Ethan Green. For Andrew and Paula, for their daughters, Emily and Laura, for Arnold and Claire, and their children, Tom and Nicole, Alexa and Adam and Sarah. Gracious one, we cherish the lives of our children and we cherish and remember all the wonderful grandchildren of Aiden and grand great grandchildren of Aiden and Alex and Ashton and Abby, Lizzie and Henry today. Keep us all in communion with your faithful people in every time and in every place, that at last we may rejoice together as our great family with you, Jesus the Christ and the Spirit. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as you are able to sing Amazing Grace 266.
Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Dr. James William Gordon Nicholson, now joined with his beloved Betty. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a son of your redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints of light. Amen. May God hold you and cradle you. May God be your strength. May God be your light and the way of blessing. And may the Redeemer and the giver of life remain with you now and forevermore. Amen. I'm going to invite you now downstairs to a wonderful reception where you will see some of those magnificent photos. <laughs>